All right. Can you hear me? Good. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, as you heard, I am a particle physicist, and uh, I have a confession to make. Uh, I have an embarrassing number of particles that I have to deal with. Uh, this is a real problem if you are looking for a fundamental theory. You know, you think of a fundamental theory as something that's built out of a very few building blocks. And you put those building blocks together, and uh, from that, you can then make all of the other particles that you see in the universe. And this has been an idea that we've had for a very, very long time. You know, it, it dates back to the Greeks or even further back than that. And uh, we still think about our physics in that way today when we think about particle physics. And so it is really kind of embarrassing that if you talk about all of the different particles that are in the standard model, you end up with lots and lots of them. All these particles and also quite a few of them have antiparticles to go along with it. Um, I just want to say this image is taken from the movie Particle Fever. Did anybody see that movie? Lots of people saw it. Yeah, it's a great movie. I, I really enjoyed it. And its big thing was about the Higgs. But I want to talk about a different particle. I want to talk about the neutrinos, which are the ones that are located right down here. And uh, the reason why I want to talk about the neutrinos is because of all of the particles that are out there that are in our standard model, this model that we have that has all these particles in it. And I just want to say, why is it a model? It's a model because it's very predictive, but we can't explain to you why we have all of those particles and why we can form what looks a lot like a periodic table out of them. So these neutrinos that are in the standard model, though, are the only particle within all of those uh, particles in our model that are actually misbehaving. They are doing things that we didn't actually expect within the standard model. And so we've already seen, in fact, some time ago, we saw a really interesting effect, which is called neutrino oscillations, which was beyond what it is we expect. We still haven't figured out how you put all of that into the standard model. And uh, I work then on neutrino oscillations. I'm looking for new kinds of neutrino oscillations because, frankly, I think that if you found something already, it's smart to look under the lamppost to see if you can find something more. If these neutrinos are misbehaving in one way, maybe they're misbehaving in other ways too. So to be able to look for beyond standard model physics with neutrinos, I need neutrino sources. And luckily, neutrino sources are really ubiquitous. There are many, many, many neutrinos going through you right now. Most of the neutrinos that are going through you are coming from the sun. And so they're coming uh, through you and uh, 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 you don't feel it uh, because they have very few interactions. But uh, they're there, and we've seen them. In fact, we can also go ahead and make them. We can make them uh, using uh, accelerators, particle accelerators, or at reactors. We can also see them in cosmic ray showers. So they're produced when very high energy particles hit the atmosphere and shower out. And actually, much the same process is how we make them in particle accelerators. Uh, when stars explode with supernova, more than 99% of the energy actually comes out in neutrinos. So that beautiful light that you see when people show you supernova, that's a very small fraction of the total energy in the supernova. And then there are the relic neutrinos from the Big Bang. Okay? There are a billion neutrinos in every cubic meter of space coming from that everywhere in the entire universe. So neutrinos are something which uh, you may not know very well, but they're actually all around you all the time. So again, the reason why you don't know them is because unlike particles like the electron, which you know very well, the interaction of the neutrino is very rare. We call it the weak force. We call it weak for a reason. Um, interactions simply don't happen very often. In fact, a typical neutrino that is coming from the sun has a very good chance of traveling through 200 Earths before it interacts at all. So it can go through a lot of material before interacting. So uh, how do you actually see something like that? Well, first of all, our first problem is that the neutrinos are neutral. And our detectors that we build actually respond to electric charge. So seeing a neutral particle is a little bit of a problem. So how do our detectors actually work? Well, when charged particles fly through a detector, they ionize the material. So it's very much like what you see when you have a spectacular thunderstorm like we had yesterday. 
I was stunned by that storm. <laughs> um, and I, I spent a lot of time in the Midwest at Fermilab, and I thought that was quite something. Um, but just like with lightning, we can observe the trails of ionization that happen. Uh, the neutrino, though, so here's the trails of ionization from charged particles that are going through one of our detectors, but the neutrino has no electric charge. It's neutral. So how are we going to see it at all? Well, the way we're going to see it is we're going to see it by the mess that it makes. So I think of neutrinos a lot like ghosts. How do you know if there's a ghost in your house? You see it? Do you see your ghost? Most people don't see their ghosts, okay? But they do see the mess that the ghosts make, okay? And that's what happens with neutrinos. A neutrino comes in, it interacts, say, right at this point right here, and outsprays a whole bunch of particles. And so it's the mess the neutrino makes that allows us to actually understand that a neutrino was actually there. And this is a really nice example of a picture from a bubble chamber. There's a magnetic field on this bubble chamber, which is why the tracks separate and spin around. And uh, a nice thing about a bubble chamber is that you can build really big bubble chambers because, like I said, they don't inter uh, neutrinos don't interact very often. And in fact, we even have to look at detectors that are much, much larger. Detectors that are, for example, up to 40 kilotons is something that we're talking about now. OK, so I have these neutrinos. And the neutrinos come in three different varieties. The word we use for it is flavors, and uh, it would be really much more fun if we named them like chocolate, strawberry, and vanilla. But we didn't. We named them the electron neutrino, the muon neutrino, and the tau neutrino. And so if you cannot see a neutrino, how do you know what type of neutrino was actually there? The way that you can know it is because the weak interaction has a peculiarity, OK? So when particles interact, you can think of them as colliding and then coming off again. And if you think about an elastic collision, like the sort of thing that happens on your pool table, two balls hit each other and they fly off. Two balls in, two balls out. And in fact, that happens with neutrinos. There's an interaction where the neutrino comes in, it strikes something, that something comes out, and a neutrino comes out. But neutrinos also have a very special kind of interaction associated with them. What happens is a neutrino comes in, and instead of a neutrino out, you get a charged particle coming out. So how does that work? OK, I want to give an analogy from biology. So let's think about little viruses. Sometimes a little virus meets another little virus, and they get together. When they get together, they can exchange some genes, all right? <laughs> so you can think of quantum numbers, which describe things like the flavor of a neutrino, as genes. Electric charge is a quantum number also. So a neutrino might come in, and there might be an exchange of the charge gene right here as it interacts with, say, a particle that, like the neutron. So this was neutral, this was neutral, but it exchanges a charged gene. So that means that this suddenly becomes charge plus one, which means this has to become charge minus one. Charge is conserved in my picture as the charged gene is exchanged. But I end up now with two charged particles coming out, two charged particles I can actually see in my detector. I can see a proton, and I can see an electron in my detector. So, how do I tell my neutrinos apart? Well, an electron neutrino, it turns out the names actually do make sense, OK? An um, uh, electron neutrino comes in, and an electron comes out. A muon neutrino comes in, and a muon will come out. A tau neutrino comes in, and a tau will come out. And that's how I know what type of neutrino I actually have. All right. So we identify the neutrino by what comes out. And Luckily, then in my detector, my uh, electron, my muon, and my tau all look different. And so I can tell the difference between these different particles by the different tracks that they actually leave in my detector. So this is really great. 
and we have seen neutrino interactions in lots of detectors. We have seen them for a very long time. It was actually in the 1950s that we saw our first neutrino interaction. And uh, so we have been working with neutrinos for a very long time. And fairly early on, we discovered that we have a very strange problem with our neutrinos. The problem with our neutrinos is that sometimes they come into our detector and they don't seem to interact at all. They just, it's like the neutrinos disappear. So we see tracks and then we move our detector, say, and then there's just no sign of the neutrinos at all. And then it may come back again. The reason why I love what I work on, this is a description of neutrino oscillations, is because this is quantum mechanics happening at human scales. It's happening on the size of my detector and even larger. It happens on the sizes of kilometers. And I think that that is really fantastic. Because up until I started working with uh, neutrinos, at some level, quantum mechanics was very, very abstract to me. And now I can actually see it happening. So that's what I want to talk to you about. Today, I want to talk to you a bit about quantum mechanics and how that fits in with neutrinos. To talk about this, to talk about quantum mechanics, you have to talk about waves. Because uh, quantum mechanics is just uh, intimately connected to the idea of particles being waves. So I want to spend a little bit of time moving away from neutrinos and teaching you a little bit about waves, and then we'll come back to the neutrinos again. So there are lots of different kinds of waves. There are what I call physical waves, things like ocean waves, electromagnetic waves, and quantum probability waves. And the thing to remember is that a wave is a wave is a wave, just like a rose is a rose is a rose, OK? Once you understand waves in one way, you understand waves in all ways. So what's a wave? All right, it's not that. That's not what I mean. <laughs> Let's talk about waves you know. In fact, this is actually a picture of Osaka. Um, there was just a huge earthquake in Osaka. So the wave that is most in the news at the moment is the earthquake wave. Here is what it looks like on a, on a seismology chart. Let's talk about what happens in an earthquake. Each particle in the Earth is tenuously connected to the other particles through friction. It's a remnant of the electromagnetic force. And so let's say that I have a, a bit of Earth, and something thrusts a little bit of my Earth upward, OK? That is going to pull along the other particles that are next to it. So if you have this thing bobbing upward, then uh, it'll pull along its neighbors. So it pulls along its neighbors, and then it settles back down again. But the neighbor pulls along its neighbor. And so now you have this wave that's moving outward because these particles have been connected. And the particles are moving up and down, even though the wave is moving off in two different directions. Another wave that I think all of you know very well is, of course, ocean waves. Actually, ocean waves are the reason, one of the reasons why I am in physics, because I absolutely love ocean waves. I think that they were absolutely beautiful from the time I was really little. And my dad spent a lot of time talking to me about ocean waves. Ocean waves are a little more complicated than the uh, earthquake wave. Um, what happens is the water molecules are actually tumbling in an ocean wave. And so what happens is these little circles, if you pick one spot in the circle, it's going to bob up and down with time. And uh, when the ocean floor rises enough to interfere with this tumbling, what happens is that your wave will crest. And so that's why your wave ends up coming up and flipping over as you get to the edge of the beach. So again, we're in a very similar situation to what I was talking about with the earthquake in the sense that in the middle of the ocean, the water doesn't actually go very far. It's just tumbling. But the wave itself is traveling away from where the water is, is tumbling over. Then, of course, there's a really, really classic kind of wave, which is the sound wave. So that's what you hear here. So sound waves are disturbances of the air. It's actually a pressure wave. So instead of having something which is bobbing up and down, you have something which is moving like this. And again, the rarefied and the uh, uh, compressed regions are actually uh, moving along through space. But the particles themselves are not actually moving very far as they get to your ear. So that's what's special about waves. There's a last kind of wave that I want to talk about, and those are electromagnetic waves. 
These are also disturbances, and just like the earthquake that transported enormous amounts of energy outward, or the ocean wave, or even the sound wave was transporting energy to your ear, electromagnetic waves are also disturbances which transport energy. But you can ask disturbances of what, all right? The energy coming from the sun is traveling through a vacuum. So how is this happening? What kind of a disturbance are we talking about? It's a disturbance of the electric and magnetic fields, which is why it's called an electromagnetic wave. So what do I mean by that? Well, let's talk about charges and magnets, OK? Charges and magnets like to talk to each other. And they talk to each other through fields. You can visualize the fields. Uh, the classic one is, of course, with the magnet. Everybody's done the iron filing uh, uh, trick. But also, you can do a sort of similar thing uh, if you set up charges on two little posts and you take a look at what happens uh, with a material where things can't move very far. And so what you end up with is you end up with this field between any two charges or between the poles of your magnet. And so in a really simplistic argument, let's say I have a very simple universe. That's a classic thing for physicists to do. We always start out with a very, very simple universe, and then we get closer to our universe we have. So I have a very simple universe with a few charges located very far. They're many, many light years away from each other, OK? So I put down an electric charge in the middle of my universe with all these other charges very far away. And it takes time for the other charges to feel the push or pull of the new charge that I've put in the middle of my universe. So it's going to take time for these other charges to, find, to understand that the new charge is out there because that information can't reach it except at the speed of light. And I've put them many light years apart. So what happens when a charge oscillates? Here I've put down my charge. It's sending out its field in all directions. Okay, And now I'm going to wiggle my charge. Okay. I wiggle my charge, and at first the field lines bend, and then my charge ends up over here to one side. It settles down with all of its field lines back again. Here, I move my charge back. Oops, sorry. Where was my charge going? There, there's my charge going back. And again, see these, these lines out here don't realize that my charge has moved and, needs to be, and they need to be pulled back, right? So it takes a little while for them to realize that they actually have to come back to the beginning. So what's happening with my lines as I do that is that they're wiggling back and forth. So a moving charge is producing a wiggly electric field line. Uh, it also produces a magnetic field. And that field also gets dragged along as the motion changes too. And a moving charge is producing then a disturbance in both an electric and the magnetic field. And that's what's propagating through space at the speed of light that's bringing light, say, from the sun to where you are as you're sitting on the beach. Now, we can think of these electromagnetic waves as little energy packets, sort of photon particles. Or we can think of them as waves. And either way, it's very nice if you're sitting on the beach uh, it works out quite well for you. Energy is being brought to you. So an electron moving up and down in the sun disturbs the electric field, it disturbs the magnetic field, and it produces electromagnetic waves. Or alternatively, the sun is producing these little energy packets of photons coming to you. OK. Weren't we talking about neutrinos? Why is she having this lecture? All right. The reason is because in quantum field theories, I can make an analogy between photons and neutrinos and between electromagnetic fields for the case of the photon and neutrino fields for the neutrino. So neutrinos are disturbances in a neutrino field that permeates our universe. That's what the neutrino is that is actually interacting in my detector. The thing that's happening in my detector, I like to think of as a little neutrino quake. All right. How fast will a particle quake move? So this is the classic equation that all of you know, E equals mc squared. Uh, you know, when I ask people, I asked my father's Kiwanis Club what they knew about uh, physics. 
you know, they were supposed to just write on a little card the thing that they knew about physics. And I would say about 75% of them said E equals MC squared. The other 25% said bombs, which really concerned me. <laughs> I don't know where that came from. So anyway, I want to say there are no neutrino bombs. <laughs> Anyway, E equals mc squared is the equation that you've all learned. Um, but E equals mc squared tells you about what happens if a particle is sitting still. M is the rest mass. You can add a kinetic energy term in also. So you just say, OK, this is because the particle is in motion. And this is because it has uh, energy because it has mass. So that's the equation for a particle that's moving. And it turns out a big mass particle and a little mass particle with the same total energy is going to have to have less kinetic energy because some of that energy went into the mass. And we're going to have a particle quake that moves more slowly in the one case. And in the case where it's smaller, it will move more quickly. So you will have different particle quake wave packets depending on their motion. OK, that's great. I can get my neutrino to my detector now. Now I have to make my neutrino disappear, as I have told you. All right? So it turns out that for this to happen, neutrinos have to be complicated waves. So let me make my wave picture that I've given you a little bit more complicated. So one more thing about waves, and this is actually one of the things that I think is really, really neat about waves. Um, waves can have very complicated shapes that are built out of the simple shapes of a single wave that you know well. So a really classic thing to do is to put your finger in water and bob it up and down. And what happens is you see the ripples moving out because you're doing that. If you took both fingers and put it in the water, what would happen is that it wouldn't perfectly go outward. You would see a funny pattern appear. And that pattern is called an interference pattern. What it does is it causes the wave to be misshapen. So oddly shaped waves you get by adding together two other waves. And lots of waves have multiple components. I mean, the musical chords are a classic example of something with multiple components. Lights are something with multiple components. You've certainly split light using a prism and seen many of the different components that are actually out there. And it's when all these components reach your eyes, you can actually uh, 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 detect certain parts of that, and your brain sorts it all out. So that's what happens when you put together waves that are very different. But what happens when you put together waves that are very, very similar? So do people, does anybody out here play the flute? I have a few flute players. Good. OK. What happens when you have two flutes and you very slightly mistune one? You, you get a wah, wah, wah sound. Yeah. It's going to sound something like this. Could you hear it, the wah, wah, wah? Great. OK. This happens because the waves are actually very, very close together in frequency. So if I add these two similar waves in frequency, what happens when you add them up is when they exactly align, like right here, you get a really big sound, twice the sound. But here, where they're, because they're slightly offset, they end up completely out of phase right there. You don't get any sound at all. And so it just disappears. So musical beats occur when a tiny frequency di physical difference happens between two instruments. Okay, The little tiny physical difference that I had here, I actually glued these down, so I have to hold it up, is this little piece of mass that I put onto one of the tuning forks. So one of my tuning forks has got a slightly different mass than the other tuning fork. So here it is. There's my tiny little extra piece of mass. And that's what get, is giving you these musical beats. OK. So it turns out that particle waves may be mixtures too. A particle might consist of multiple components, each with different masses. And it turns out that this is actually what is happening with the neutrino. So what happens is that the wave we call the electron neutrino is actually turns out to be a combination of three different mass states. So three different frequencies as it propagates through space. The same is true for the muon neutrino and the tau neutrino. Or if we can flip it around and say that each mass state is a mixture of the three flavor states. 
So I know that a few of you out here probably have done some work in quantum mechanics and you know the idea of mixed states. And that's what we're talking about here. So the waves can actually interfere as these move along. And this is really weird. Uh, there's no longer a one-to-one -one correspondence between the type of particle we actually see in our detector. The flavor that came out that allowed us to say what type of neutrino was there doesn't allow us to say what the mass of that neutrino was. It was actually a mixture of masses. And so if this is true and the masses are nearly the same, the waves for each mass um, are, 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 will interfere and beats will happen. And that's what happens in neutrino oscillations. So what happens is I start out and I have all of one type of neutrino. For example, in this picture, I have a new mu. And if I look at a distance from the source, then you can effectively think of that as time, OK? As I move away from the source, that's time that the neutrinos have lived. And so what happens is the interference turns on. And so as a result, here is where I end up with a node in my beats. And then they come back again. So all of a sudden, I have all of my new mu's, again, my muon neutrinos returning, and then they go away over and over and over again. And the thing about it is that particles can't just disappear. So that would be really bad. If we suddenly in the universe had particles just vanishing, this would be a very, very strange universe to live in. We like to believe that energy is conserved, E equals mc squared, so the particles existence at some level has got to be conserved also. And so what we think happens is that as the uh, neutrino fades away of one type, another type of neutrino is actually appearing in my detector. But if my detector can't actually see that kind of neutrino for some reason, I have built the wrong detector to actually see, for example, electron neutrinos, then I'm doomed. As far as I can tell, my new neutrinos disappeared and came back, disappeared and came back. And that's what neutrino oscillations are. And so what we want to do when we study neutrino oscillations is we want to start out with a well-understood source. For example, I mentioned reactors at the beginning of this discussion. Um, and I want to measure how many of these neutrinos I have very close to the reactor. Then I want to look far away from the, actor, the reactor, say kilometers away, say hundreds of kilometers away. And I want to look there too. And I want to see, do I see all of my neutrinos? And if I'm smart, I figure out how to put my detector at just the right spot so that I'm at the point where they've all disappeared. I could be very unlucky. I could actually put it at the spot where they all came back again. That's a mistake. You should try to put it where they've all gone away. Uh, and it's hard if you're just starting out looking and you don't know where to look. And you look and you discover that, in fact, neutrinos oscillate. This is one of my favorite pictures uh, of the data that comes from neutrino oscillations because it just has that wiggle. That's the wiggle you're supposed to see if neutrinos actually oscillate. So this is why the um, Nobel Prize was given in, in 2015. There were many, many experiments that were very important to our believing that neutrinos really do have this behavior. Um, it's based on the wonderful results of many experiments. In fact, there's a very active group here at Boulder who is, that are working on neutrino oscillations. Um, and the experiments that they were on have contributed to that Nobel Prize. So at this point, we really understand uh, the idea of neutrino oscillations uh, uh, very well. So the lesson before I go on is that everything you learn about waves, everything you learn about the waves around you is completely applicable to particle waves. As I said, a wave is a wave. And if you want to master quantum mechanics, then the first thing you have to master is waves. And if there's anything that I think about the way that we teach physics in America, I think our biggest problem is that we don't teach waves at a very, very early age. It's a very easy thing to teach, and uh, it's one where you can actually do many, many things without understanding any math at all. So you can start with very little children teaching them about waves, and then they can learn what the phenomenon looks like, and then add the math on later so that they have the language to better describe what it is that they're seeing. So this is one thing that I would really like to have you walk away with, is that I think this is something that we really need to have in our school system. And if you would like to learn quantum mechanics, that's where you should actually start. OK, so 
at this point, we have a really beautiful picture for our new standard model. The Greek letter for the neutrinos is the nu. So we have to now somehow fit in this oscillation uh, capability into our model. And we really actually don't know very well how to do this. We built our standard model so that neutrinos didn't have this kind of behavior. And now we somehow have to try to fit it in. Uh, with that said, we actually are in a very interesting situation because we have been able to do enough measurements and understand enough parameters about neutrino oscillations that this new standard model, the phenomenology of it, is very predictive. If I see neutrino oscillations in one venue, say I see a muon neutrino turning into an electron neutrino, I know that with the same frequency that muon neutrino will turn into a tau neutrino or vice versa. I can actually make predictions now and it is working incredibly well. With that said, you know, we have this lovely system that describes the, the electron neutrino, the muon neutrino, and the tau neutrino. But there are other things going on, and we need to try to understand better what those other things mean. So we are seeing waves, but the waves that we are seeing don't seem to necessarily have the right frequency. In fact, they definitely don't have the right frequency to be the waves that fit within this model. So as we look for neutrino oscillations, we are seeing the wave signals that belong to these three neutrinos, and we're also seeing this disappearance effect at other frequencies than what we actually expected. So there's a set of beats that have the wrong frequency. And the significance of those signals is statistically rather low. So we have a sort of level at which we call something a discovery. That level is the word that we use for it is five sigma. It's a statistical measure of how strong the signal actually is. And below that, we really worry because we think it could be some kind of a background or some kind of an effect which we call a systematic effect. So you might be thinking to yourselves, what does she mean by background? So let me explain it this way. Let's say that you wanted to go do an experiment where you had figured out and predicted how many redheaded women there are in this world. And then you go out and you start counting redheaded women. And what you discover is that there are more than what you thought. What happened? L'Oreal. Exactly right. OK. <laughs> And those women with the L'Oreal, they're your background. You can't look at them and know for sure, because they look just like the signal that you're looking for, but they're fakes, OK? And we have to worry about that in our detectors, because you know we can't go to each interaction and say, are you real or are you fake, OK? We take what we get, and then we do the very best we can in order to be able to predict how many are fake and how many are real. We try to build our experiment so there's the fewest fakes that can possibly be in there. But sometimes we are faked out. And that's OK in the sense that that is the way science really works. It is a problem because sometimes the uh, world gets a hold of a result and gets very excited about it. And uh, then they wonder why the, why the signal uh, goes away. Uh, and that happened to me two weeks ago. Uh, so one of my experiments has actually uh, seen an effect that's associated with this wave that seems to be going with the wrong frequency. And we have seen a major increase in the significance of that signal. And we put out a paper on this saying, hey, you know, there's a big neutrino conference that just happened, our conference uh, that, that we have every two years. So we put it out right before the conference saying, hey, this happened. We have really terrific significance. We're almost five sigma, but not quite five sigma. And it got picked up by the newspapers. And uh, so you, we got all kinds of uh, headlines about this. Uh, you should be cautious about headlines. <laughs> There are certain aspects of the headlines that are actually correct. Uh, I like thrills and baffles. That's, that's really, really true. Um, I like mysterious. I like the question mark. 
um, intriguing hints. I think all of that is perfectly reasonable for what it is that we are actually seeing. Why is it that I am not ready? I mean, we're at 4.8 sigma. We're very, very close to this discovery level, five sigma. Why is it that I am really, really, really being cautious? And so I actually got quoted explaining why it is that I'm feeling rather cautious. I'm not ready to bet my money on this yet because the excess is a kind of blob on a plot. <laughs> what if something else can make a blob? To be really convinced, I want to see with high significance this predicted to wiggle. Which sounds ridiculous. You don't realize what you sound like when you're talking to reporters until they write it down <laughs> and they put it up there. And you're like, oh. And I, I did say that. It's really true. OK. <laughs> but it does look like a blob on the plot. It is a plot that has a hump on it. But other things might be able to cause a hump. What I really want to see at this particular new frequency is it go up and down and up again? Because it's that up and down and then up again that makes it a wave, that makes it an oscillation wave. And so that's the thing that I am looking for. OK. In fact, at this Abiga conference, this neutrino conference, we saw something like that. OK. They actually showed us a result that looks a little bit like a wiggle. It's is a very similar experiment to this Kimland experiment in that it comes from a reactor. And what it has, though, is it's a much, much shorter distance associated with it. This was over, over many hundreds of kilometers. This is over a few kilometers. It's called the dance experiment. And that's because the detector dances. It starts at one position. It moves to the next position, then the next position each day, and then back again. So it's doing its little dance back and forth. And if you look at the ratio of up to down, it actually shows the wiggle that looks a lot like what we are looking for. So nevertheless, here's the null. And so it, it could be either one of these. But this is looking pretty wiggle-like. So it's new, preliminary, intriguing, not quite proof yet. But I am really excited. OK? And I know you're all going, yeah, yeah, yeah. But what have neutrinos done for me lately? Okay, yeah, It's really true. I would be excited about that. But you know, this is the question that I often get on airplanes in various ways when I talk to people. OK. For one thing, neutrinos are inspiring. And they inspire real poets. You know, They inspire John Updike. Okay? He actually wrote a poem about neutrinos. This is not just me writing in my journal at night. Okay? This is a real poet. <laughs> so I'm very proud of that. Neutrinos also are essential to your existence. The thing that ignites the sun is a weak process. That weak process has to have a neutrino involved in it. So the sun would not be shining if it were not for neutrinos out there. So you could be very grateful that the sun is actually shining. The neutrinos are helping you with that. In fact, we can do more than that, too, though. We can actually have things that matter to us um, on a day-to-day -day basis, or at least within the, the news cycle. Um, we can do things like, for example, ask, can we build detectors to support the non-proliferation effort? Because as this reactor is producing its neutrinos, it is doing so because it is burning fuel. And as it burns fuel, what it's doing is it's producing plutonium. And plutonium is something that we want to keep an eye on and make sure that different states are not producing a lot of plutonium that is going to be made into bombs. So the IAEA, which is the International Atomic Energy Agency, is, this is a group that's charged with civil nuclear fuel cycle facilities for possible diversion of fissile material into the weapons program. And they are actually working with us, neutrino physicists, in order to try to develop detectors so that we can look at the neutrinos that are coming out of these reactors in order to understand what's going on with the fuel inside. In fact, we recently had a large experiment. It's called Watchman, just approved to be built um, and is being constructed for exactly this purpose just offshore of England, monitoring a reactor where they're going to actually tell us what's going on in the reactor to make sure that what we see is what we actually expected, and our monitoring is actually working. Um, in fact, all of this started in summer 2009, and I was at a workshop uh, when, this, uh, when this first got ignited. And there's groups all over the world that are actually working on this. It has really encouraged a continuing worldwide effort to use neutrinos. I like to say neutrinos for peace. 
And so here is how it actually works. The neutrino, this is from a reactor. This is by an MIT graduate student, Chris Jones, who works with me. It's a simulation of the flux coming from the reactor. And so you're looking at the spectrum of a reactor burn with time. And I want you to notice that this part over here is changing at a different rate than this part over here. This part is going down much more quickly than this part. This part is coming from the plutonium. This part is actually coming from the uranium. So you can really look at this flux, and you can really see that you get a change of the flux with time that tells you about the plutonium that's being produced. OK, you can use the neutrinos directly, or you can use the technology that makes the neutrinos for benefits to society. And that's actually part of another project that I am working on. So let me take you back to this reactor experiment and this wiggle. And the reality of it is that no matter how long you sit there, uh, it'll be hard to get enough statistics to get this wiggle to end up being at five sigma. It just takes a lot of statistics in order to be able to do this. And it really helps if you can build a really, really big detector. It turns out to be hard to do that right next to your reactors. It's very confined space because you're very, very close to the reactor core. So you're kind of stuck with these reactor experiments. So I've come up with this idea that what we should do instead is we should develop uh, an experiment which uses a single isotope that decays at rest. It decays through the thing called the beta decay, which is the same thing that's happening in the reactors to produce the neutrinos. So what happens is your neutron decays, and it produces an electron antineutrino, a proton, and an electron. And if I describe the amount of energy that's coming out of this, you get a really pretty spectrum. And you'll just have to trust me that that's pretty high up in energy compared to what most isotopes actually produce. So it's a really nice spectrum to use. The thing about it is that if you go higher in energy with your isotope, your isotope decays much faster. So the lithium-8 that we're interested in working with decays in milliseconds. So that means I have to produce it. I have to constantly produce it. So I need some kind of an accelerator that can do this. And so I want to use cyclotrons for this purpose. So the idea of a cyclotron is you inject your beam at the middle of the cyclotron. And remember, the particles bent in the magnetic field that I showed you. And so I can add a little bit of energy as it bends around, and it will curl up to the outside, and then it will come out and can be sent off to my experiment at very high energy. This is actually a very old idea from 1939. But everything old is new again in many ways. Um, through the 1960s, there was a thriving cyclotron program at universities and in industry in the United States. And then there was this split between physics and the real world. And the real world. Um, uh, physics went off to physically large, very high energy accelerators like the accelerators that you saw discussed in particle fever. Um, they left cyclotrons behind because you can't build a big enough cyclotron that way. But in the real world, they developed all kinds of industrial and medical applications of cyclotrons. This was mainly developed actually outside of the United States. And so with our bringing this back to neutrino physics, we're bringing these ideas from outside of the United States back into the United States again. Neutrino physics needs low cost, high rates, but not high energy, and accelerators to, uh, near to detectors. And this just doesn't necessarily suit the design of the national laboratories that we have. So cyclotrons could be the answer to this. But what I think is extremely neat about my cyclotron is that my cyclotron can produce 10 times the power of the present machines. Our design produces an uh, order of magnitude more power. And the same machines are machines that produce very important radioactive isotopes for imaging and for treatment. And uh, so the design of this cyclotron can actually really change lives, because we're now able to produce some very rare isotopes that are much needed in larger quantities, 10 times larger quantities. In fact, I would like to scrape off some beam as we are running and make isotopes with it sell those isotopes, and we would become the first uh, self-funded particle physics experiment in the world. <laughs> so that, that's my vision. Um, so watch for Isodar. That's, that's the name of the experiment. So this is where I want to end. But I want to say that I hope what I've convinced you is that this is a very tiny particle. It is a particle with a mass much, much smaller than all of the other particles in that standard model that I've shown you. But even that smallest particle can make a very big splash in this world. Thank you. Uh, I heard a slide that had 10 to the 
the ninth. A billion neutrinos in every cubic meter of space, yeah. Every second. Uh, no, no, they're, they're just, they're flying all around, so that's an uh, instantaneous average. So, okay, doesn't that mean it's impossible to ever get a vacuum? You always will have neutrinos flying through? You won't go every, anywhere in the universe? So, these particles are very, very, very tiny. So, there's a lot of space between these neutrinos. They're effectively, you know, point like particles. So, a billion. Actually, it sounds like a lot, but in a cubic meter, you know, there's a lot of space. Yeah. So, I apologize, but I think you said this, I just want to make sure I mm -hmm. mind understood it. Your, your blip that you're trying to get uh, significant data for, mm -hmm. if it did prove out, that would basically represent a fourth. A fourth neutrino state, that's right. So every one of these different oscillation frequencies, you know, are indicating more states. So it would indicate a fourth neutrino, which would be very peculiar because one of the things that you should note at the very beginning is that all of my different particles seem to be coming in sets of three. I have three neutrinos. I have electron, muon, and tau. I have three independent charged particles in this universe. I actually have three kinds of quarks that have a positive charge. It's fractional, but it's positive. I have three kinds of quarks that have the negative charge. And we have absolutely no good reason for why that is true. We do not know why that is true at all. But it would be very peculiar if we found an extra neutrino, and that was the only one that was out there. So what happens is you're searching through this space, and you see something. And if it works out, and it turns out to be the neutrino, and that's a big if, OK? But if it works out, that would probably tell you that there are more. And in fact, this has worked before. We started out, and up until about um, the late 1990s, early 2000s, we had only seen two kinds of neutrinos interact, the new mu and the, new, and the, the uh, electron neutrino and the muon neutrino. It was only then that we saw the tau neutrino interact. But we were very, very certain that the tau neutrino was there for lots of different reasons. But it was because, you know, mainly there's this big space in our periodic chart. And it is a very, very predictive set of circumstances that you see. And so this just comes back to my statement at the beginning. It's a very embarrassing situation because in the past, periodic tables have always indicated something is deeper. And so, uh, and we really have no idea what it is. So finding new particles can really help. Yeah, and then. It is. It's called a sterile neutrino, which is a horrible name. I, I, I do not approve of the name sterile neutrino, but I cannot. It, that name was chosen before I came into the field. So the reason why it's called sterile is because we know that there are only three neutrinos that interact through the weak force. We can tell that through our precision measurements that we have made. So whatever this neutrino is, it's not interacting through the weak force. That doesn't mean it doesn't interact with other, through other forces. It just means that it's weaker than weak. It's a very, very weak force. And so uh, that's, that's, it would be a different kind of neutrino. Yeah. Uh-huh. Right. Why does dry cleaning fluid work really well? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So when the neutrino comes in and interacts, it needs to flip into an electron for us to be able to see it. And uh, when it does that, it also flipped the neutron into a proton. Right? That was one of the uh, pictures that I showed you back at the beginning. So it turns out that instead of trying to actually see the, new, the electron that came out, it might be easier and better for you to just try to see the new element that appeared because you flipped the neutron into a proton. In fact, it turns out this is, flips it, the, the chlorine flips into argon. Argon is actually um, something that you can extract out of this dry cleaning fluid very well. And so uh, that was the purpose behind it. And in fact, that detector was originally designed by a chemist who understood how to actually get the argon out. And of course, physicists never believe chemists. <laughs> okay. And the guy was saying, I see fewer uh, of these argon atoms than I should. And they're like, well, you lost them. 
<laughs> you can't get them out of your dry cleaning fluid. And so uh, it took a really long time for people to believe that experiment uh, uh, because of that. And uh, there were more complications to the experiment than just the idea that you had trouble with this detector and you had a hard time actually extracting the argon from it. Another thing was that those neutrinos were coming from the sun. And it took many, many years for people to believe that we understood the sun well enough in order to be able to predict the number of neutrinos that would be coming from the sun. That we wouldn't just be off by a factor of two because we didn't understand our prediction for how many neutrinos we should see. So we moved away from those kinds of detectors to ones where we can actually see more about the event so that we understood better what was going on. But that was actually the start. That was the detector that was located in a new a mine where we're building a new set of experiments in South Dakota. Yeah? So if this sterile neutrino doesn't interact by the weak force, how do you it interact? It, it, it oscillates, right? The only way that we would know it's out there is because it does this little dance with the other neutrinos. So you can have... So your neutrino now is no longer a mixture of three states, it's a mixture of four states. And sometimes this sterile effect appears in it. So you only see it through the oscillations. Yeah? Can you please summarize uh, for me as a non-neutrino expert uh, the current state of knowledge of the masses of the neutrino? Oh, that is a really good question. We have no direct measurement of neutrino mass. Now let me explain what I mean by that, because you don't take the little neutrino and stick it on a scale and say, ah, look at that. Um, the way that you get neutrino mass, the way you understand what the neutrino mass is, is you look at the, the decay of particles, for example, tritium, and uh, if the neutrino, the neutrino has to take away, as it leaves, a little bit of mass. So that means that in this decay, which is actually a beta decay, the same decay that I had up here, let me go back here. So if you have this decay and this guy has a little bit of mass, then this electron is going to only go up to a certain energy and no further because that mass went into the neutrino. So you have to measure the end point of the energy, the highest energy of that electron to incredibly precise uh, uh, levels in order to be able to tell whether there was a neutrino and what the neutrino mass was. This is an extremely difficult experiment to do. And starting three weeks ago, uh, an experiment called Katrin, which is the next state-of-the-art experiment, just turned on in order to be able to do it. So right now, we have to surmise what those masses are coming from the neutrino oscillation frequencies that we see. And those masses that we see are, uh, uh, let's see, 10 to the 9 uh, orders of magnitude lower than the other collection of particles that are out there, like the electron. So they're really tiny masses, very, very different from all the other particles that are more or less grouped together in the masses that they have. So we hope to see the direct mass, but uh, we haven't gotten there yet. No, it's around a milli electron volts. It's about a thousand lower. One EV is actually about the level of the sterile neutrino. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, should, should I answer more? Yeah, I'll take two more. Take two more? Okay. Yeah, I like answering questions. <laughs> so I'm a little concerned that you seem to apply, I know you don't mean this, but you seem to apply uh, that, the, that you either have a hint or you have five signals. Yeah, it is a smooth transition, right? And it is, but it is a, I, I just, it's, it's, a, it's a strong flip for the way people think. Exactly. Right. So what I would like to know is where would physics be if in the past we always demanded five sigma? Oh. Or we said we had to discover. So I love you. I think that's great. <laughs> I'm totally, I'm totally, totally with you. Now let me just say, I'm totally with you because what you're saying. Oh, that Camlan plot. That's that that Camlan plot is is many sigma. It's like seven sigma. No, 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 no. It's 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 really big. It's a seven sigma effect. Um, but uh, the, but the other one that I showed you is not. It's it's really small. But uh, but let me just say when. People start out looking for things, 
you know, it, they almost always appear at the very edge of what their detectors can actually do. And so they always end up, or do usually end up, being very small levels of, of signals. And they some, can sometimes, because it's at the edge of what the detector can do, be kind of warped. You know, the signal doesn't look quite right. And so these we call anomalies. And I actually am an anomaly hunter. I love anomalies. Um, I am quite interested in what nature has to say to me. Um, and, uh, and this is the way nature speaks, is through these little anomalies that come up. And sometimes you win with them and sometimes you don't. But I think it's really, I, I absolutely am with you. I think you have to pursue these things when you see them. And, uh, uh, and many, what's important, you put your anomaly out there and then people attack it and you're like, oh my little anomaly, it just got attacked. But, uh, but it's a good thing, you know, it's a really good debate that we have. And um, what worries me a lot is that if you didn't see anything and you put a result out, people don't debate enough about it. So this is actually going to be the last line of the talk that I give in two days at Tassie. <laughs> Quite literally, this is one of the conclusions of my talk, is that you have to really think about limits as carefully as you do about these signals, because uh, you could be as easily missing something, and that would be really too bad. You know, nature, nature isn't, I'm at the risk of my theory friends that are here, and I'm surrounded by them, Nature isn't elegant. At least, nature doesn't have the same taste we have, okay? Nature is producing all these particles, and they're doing things that we don't expect, and we, we figure out how to put them in, and uh, so these anomalies fit into that kind of a problem. Still, anomalies come and anomalies go, and you can't be too attached to your anomaly also. Yeah. Again, non-physicist, a dumb, a dumb guy in the room. But I saw that, your periodic chart. Mm -hmm. And if you have this new neutrino, does it slide in with the other neutrinos or does it come outside the ring to start a whole new set of rings outside? So we really don't know how to put it into the periodic table yet. We really, really don't. I mean, at the moment, we only have one that we have a sign of. We really don't know enough about how that would fit in. It does. It opens. I would tell you that it opens a floodgate. I think that there's a lot of limitations on where the other particles could actually be that are charged. It's easier to see charged particles than it is to see neutral particles. And so there are very, very strong limits on those. So it would really, it would be an enormous change to our field if this works out. So that's, <laughs> that's such a huge question. I have to say, one of the things that drives me crazy is that you always have to solve dark matter. No matter what it is you find, it's got to solve dark matter. But, um, but dark matter is a huge question, and we really need to try to understand what it is. And it could be that there are ways to fit this into dark matter, but we have to understand a lot more about what it is we're seeing before we can make it actually fit. Right? Okay. Thank you. Thank you.